This house, we call it sacred. And, and we use that word not loosely. Casa Mayan is a space in history that expresses a minority's journey during some horrible times to create a humanitarian, cultural, information, business, and home center over 50 years of Denver history that was a holistic center for understanding Mexican-American culture, but also to understand other cultures and the arts, a place that bridged social, cultural, and economic barriers. The intensity of activities that took place, the spiritual activities, whether they were saving lives, the prayers, the feeling safe and accepted and loved, the generosity, the hospitality, is what made it sacred in our mind. I'm the grandson of the family who lived here and who was displaced. And I have, uh, I'm a primary source. I, I experience the people and the businesses who were in this community. Hearing stories from my grandmother and my grandfather, my mother, and having walked the neighborhood with my mother, who gave walking tours to me as a child, the information and the narratives that I heard about what our community was like were very contrary to my experiences. And not only later on were they contrary, they were inaccurate, they were incomplete, and undermined the grassroots actions of our community to save this house, to save the block, and to tell our stories. So I started a nonprofit called Auraria and Casa Mayan Heritage to research the stories, to tell the histories, and to present alternatives in how we tell the stories through architecture, urban design, and through uh, museum, house museum uh, programming. Uh, this is where Casa Mayan began, but we are looking at the oldest remaining residential structure in Denver, which was uh, built in 1872, 150 years old, by a Quaker family from Chesterfield, Pennsylvania. The Quaker services that took place in this house is very symbolic of the spiritual foundation we had in our community. The, the tolerance, the, the rights for a, a, a women and the fight against slavery by the Quakers is really a wonderful foundation uh, in telling the history of this house. To understand Casa Mayan, you do have to understand the individuals who lived here. And the journey and the, the adventures that they had to take from Mexico to Denver to really understand the spirit of this house and what, why it became a, a major uh, cultural humanitarian center. My grandparents' arrival in Denver, particularly Auraria, was the result of the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Like one million families that journeyed from the south to the north, they escaped the revolution for various reasons. My grandfather, Ramon Gonzalez, and my grandmother, Carolina Gonzalez, epitomized the conflicts of the revolution in that they were from different economic, educational backgrounds. My grandmother was a nurse. She took care of soldiers on both sides of the revolution. She took care of people regardless of their backgrounds or their, their political stance. My grandfather was a very creative person, industrious. My grandfather, my grandmother were intimately involved with the key players of the Mexican Revolution, such as Pancho Villa and his wife. Pancho Villa wanted my grandfather as a strategist for the war because he was a college educated and a strategist in chess and 
problem solving, but he had loyalties on both sides. They left Mexico by motor car compared to the majority of a lot of the families who left by train. My grandmother grew up with understanding the herbs and herbologies and the, the medicines as a nurse, but she was a great cook and that's how they survived. In fact, going from their journey from Mexico to America, they would make meals for the miners. My grandfather was a photographer, so in their journey to Denver, they'd stop in these farms and mining camps, and these poor families who couldn't afford going to a studio, my grandfather would barter with them in exchange, just like the exchange for shelter or food, we'll take photographs of your family. When they came to Denver, this was at the height of the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, that's the type of environment they had to deal with. But in Auraria, we didn't have that segregation or racism that we had in Denver, which was just across Cherry Creek, and uh, they found some various apartments. Auraria was a triangular space bordered by two rivers. The Cherry Creek was an intermittent streams that formed uh, over time that had periodic droughts. The Platte River was a very steady stream. It didn't have the droughts, and where these two waters came together was called confluence. And gold deposits were settled there. And when explorers uh, in the 1850s during the gold rush saw those gold deposits, they figured, well, you know, we could uh, develop trade centers for the miners. It was a space of confluence, of convergence, of, of trade and sharedness. But the type of activities that were here in, the, in our neighborhood was mixed. It wasn't planned out to today's standards of zoning. So we had uh, lots, plot, lots laid out that allowed light industry, retail, commercial, religious, educational, and residential all mixed together. And although that might seem today uh, haphazard as was used later on by the Denver Urban Renewal and Planning Department. It allowed for a wonderful organic evolution and a wonderful uh, use of, 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 of sharing spaces and services. Growing up as a kid, my mother took me around. It was a pedestrian-oriented community. People walked. We had eight churches and or eight in, religious institutions, five educational institutions in a half a radius of two blocks. We had a two acres farmer's market just a block away. We did not need cars. We, we were a walking community and that was part of the engagement and the closeness of our community was meeting each other on the porch daily and seeing our processionals and our ceremonies. In the top of that we had wonderful uh, if wonderful smells. We had the smell of bread, the smell of beer, of tamales, of sauerkraut, pickles, ice cream, cinnamon, candy. <laughs> Those are pretty good smells growing up as a kid and uh, that's an example. And of course Casa Mayan with the Mexican food. And of course some of the different ethnic groups that had their own uh, foods that came out. So uh, those are my personal memories of a very fun place and the wonderful artisans who lived here from Mexico the non-Hispanics who had printing business and, and studios, and just a wonderful interaction we had and how we supported us, each other. Where those in the printing business would make the business cards, those in the light industry would help make um, you know, other, other mechanical needs that we had. My grand grandfather, a blacksmith, providing needs for the community in exchange for music lessons or whatever you have. It was that type of of wonderful mixed-use uh, community. We were also distinct because it was a multi-ethnic community, German, Jewish, Irish, English, uh, Scottish, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Mexican, lived together in the same block. You cross Denver Cherry Creek, you had continued racial segregation up until the 60s where public spaces could not, Mexicans could not use public spaces blatant discrimination against going into restaurants and other businesses just as you cross the creek. So Raria was a safe space and we had uh, a sharing of cultures that really fit well with the Gonzalez family of Casamayan. Mm -hmm.
It was a humanitarian, in essence, to Denver. A lot of the humanitarian services and individuals who lived here, whether it be with the indigenous people or those first generation, Irish or Jewish and African Americans, established uh, our first schools, our first libraries, our first religious institutions. We had our first orphanages. This was a safe space and this allowed them to flourish. It was in the year 1933, the height of the Great Depression, where we hit the 25% you know, unemployment in the country. We had uh, economic uh, crisis, uh, home shortages for housing. It was that year my uh, grandfather had a, a severe heart attack and my mother had to nurse him. She had to be in charge of the, a lot of the decision making. On top of that, in Denver, we had one of the worst floods in 1933. And my, my Gonzalez family were left homeless. All their food and belongings were destroyed by the 1933 flood. So uh, without any economic resources, they were in a serious situation. But because of the um, creative and spiritual background of the Gonzalez family and my grandparents. The reputation of the family, particularly my grandmother, a house was, that was for rent, which is 1029th Street, one block off of Colfax. The owner recognized the ethics of my grandparents and my, particularly my grandmother, and she was able to, through the owner, to purchase this house at the time of the Great Depression. I call that the first miracle of 9th Street. For, for all things considered, if you were a white upper class woman, you couldn't get a loan for a house. People were, there was foreclosures all over uh, the country. So for her at that time to purchase one of the largest houses um, in, a, in a, a great location was a miracle and a blessing and a testimony, I believe, to her faith. Besides her indigenous background, she was a, had a Christian practicing beliefs of giving, sharing, and putting other people ahead of herself. And so it seemed to pay off when during this crisis she was able to purchase this house. Just an example to understand the severity of the housing shortage and the, the severity of the Great Depression, particularly in 1933, we had over 30 people living in this small Victorian house. This was sleeping quarters for my uncle and this was, uh, this was what we had to do. So he put a tiny sleeping cot, cot in here. Fortunately, he was naturally a shorter man of the family, but this was just the way it was. What my grandparents brought into this house was a Mexican tradition going back to where they grew up called mutual aid societies, mutualistas. These were centers that allowed those traveling from uh, Mexico to America to find centers where they could be supported economically, centers that supported their culture, their connection to their homeland, it provided legal, uh, civil rights uh, uh, assistance. Very important for uh, Mexican-American history because of the prejudices, government officials who did not appreciate the Mexican way of life or their language, or how they, in, their social uh, interactions with each other in the community. So they, they, they created these mutualistas and Casa Mayan was, a, was um, a, later became a type of mutualista, but what it evolved into for, Im, immediately was a humanitarian center and a place to help those that uh, needed a, a place to live. My grandparents, my grandmother noticed the, the children that just didn't have decent clothing or sh shoes. So being a seamstress, and she established a sewing center in her home. She partnered with the Red Cross. She also worked with the women of the community to make this a school so that they would take care of themselves without government help. And this was part of the tradition that she grew up with. So this became a sewing school. This right here is a wedding dress that was made by my grandmother 
she and other women who started the Red Cross Sewing School here would create not only practical items for the children and clothing, but also create garment and costumes for, for performing arts, for ceremonial. And what is this reminds me of is how a house and our community express the life cycles that we have, the births, the weddings, the deaths. From the start of the Depression to the end of the Depression, a movement in America where a lot of the Midwest teenage young men were forced to leave their farms, their, their communities to find work. And they had to find ways to travel and find work and they rode illegally on the railroads and these became known as hobos or homeless boys. The hobos, the homeless boys, they created their own language. They created a symbols that they would carve into telephone poles or sidewalks or fences, where to get food, shelter, or work, who to avoid, what type of people lived here. My grandparents didn't know that this house was marked by these boys. It was estimated that during the Great Depression, 250,000 of these young men uh, rode the rails. And Casa Mine is part of that American history because once they marked that house, the Mexican values my grandparents grew up with is do not turn any strangers away. We're all strangers in a strange land. And the seriousness of hospitality in their upbringing and generosity. At my, mi casa is su casa. They never turned anyone down. So they had a flood of kids coming in and young men. Can I find work? Can I find shelter? Uh, can I find food? On top of that, what was brought into this community or into this house was a rich expression of the arts, the performing arts, the visual arts, music. Some of the first Mexican dances to the community took place in this house. On top of that, they allowed students in the arts uh, in, to put up their artwork. My aunt taught indigenous dance, Mexican and Spanish dance to the neighborhood children, free. And this was where the dance classes were held. We had later on a classical guitar, flamenco guitar societies, Latin American poetry societies. We would show films here. This was very uh, extraordinary for the time to show 16 millimeter films of Spanish, what was going on in Mexico and Spain. We also had a bullfight club. We had the most varied uses of probably any house in downtown Denver. It was distinctly a Mexican expression. It was a mestizo. It was an expression of indigenous values. But other ethnic groups who were first generation of, from their country, like Irish, came to Casa Mayan. Very proud of their Irish culture, they felt welcome to share their culture with the Mexican people in this home. It, to, to be able to find something that was so uh, strong in Mexican heritage and culture, at the same time welcome other cultures, was extraordinary. By the time World War II came around, this place was a busy hub. After World War II, because of my grandfather's heart condition, how to sustain this family was a concern, of course, but because of the hospitality and the wonderful food, a lot of the students encouraged my grandparents, why don't you start a restaurant? So that's the beginning of Casa Mine as a restaurant. What we served here was the best, freshest, form of Mexican food. Very simple, but at the time it was very exotic. What I have here is a plate that was served in the beginning of the Casa Mayan in 1946. It was part of the total makeover of the house, from the furniture to the, to the costumes, to the chairs, to the tables, to the the uh, interior renovation until the details like a plate. And when I think about this plate, I also think about 
that they had to educate the people that were non-Hispanic what Mexican food was like. What is a chili, relleno, enchilada, burrito, tostada? Those not familiar with Mexican food order Mexican food and taste samples of it. And that was part of the education process during the 40s and 50s to let people know about Mexican culture through their food. A lot of the farmers who were not Hispanic in the surrounding communities did not know how to grow, would not grow some of these foods. So they had a challenge here. Well, how do we serve what is natural to our uh, region? So they, they ended up working with small farmers. A, mo a lot of them were um, people coming back from the internment camps, Japanese. I said, can you grow these chilies for us? Can you grow this type of corn? Can you grow uh, these type of beans, etc.? They were food pioneers. They also had to figure out how are they going to create corn tortillas on a large a scale, on a large scale. So they had to create a, pre a uh, corn grinder called a molino. That was not available here. We did not have the mass production technologies. It was taking something that was very labor intensive, that required a lot of skill with using the working with the corn. Can't be too wet, can't be too dry. So they developed this corn grinder to create the, the masa to, 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 to create the tortillas. Just one year after getting the license to open up a restaurant, the White House called and asked if the family, Carolina and Ramon, could provide a presidential meal for the visiting president, Harry S. Truman. So in the living room was to serve the presidential meal. So that tells you, and as I mentioned, with the hobos and the poor and uh, so forth, the diversity we had. And this is why this house, besides being Mexican, is a wonderful expression of that diversity coming together. You were inspired when you came here to, to be good citizens, to be creative and, and productive. But we still had a racial tension here. For instance, Mexican culture and tradition is eating outside. We had courtyards, fountains, but the regulations would not permit my family to serve food outside. The government did not want to have tamales served with corn husk. They, they thought this is not safe. You know, we want you to use white paper. Well, we had to fight that. My family had to educate them in talking about civil rights. This is cultural preservation rights, it's saying that this is safe. On top of that, they didn't know if it was healthy. We had to go through uh, bringing the foods to the universities, like the CSU, to say that these chilies are healthy, corn, beans are healthy and safe in our diet here. So there was a kind of a food prejudice, food racism here that they had to conquer. Another form of pressure, my aunt here, she, she started a dance club. Well, we had, going back from the 1930s, government officials come knocking at the door, wanting to know what type of activities are taking place in this house. I have to bring that up because that type of, of value system with the government to not understand or be accepting of other cultures' um, expression in the arts. To, to, be, uh, to have that type of uh, uh, questioning by the government as if we were you know, causing some political uh, dissent. And that type of attitude was part of the, in my mind, the larger displacement of minorities throughout the United States. Stereotyping us as uh, radicals, <laughs> political troublemakers. African Americans who were notable, internationally respected, as performing artists could still not eat or be allowed to eat at restaurants or hotels. They felt accepted here. People like Marian Anderson, very significant person who came here, uh, Ethel Waters and Paul Robeson. Casa Mayan remained a home open to individuals until 1974 when we were displaced from this community. The displacement of Auraria has its roots going back to 1858. The roots of urban renewal uh, go back that far back. 
Urban Renewal was a national movement. It specialized in the separation of functions. There was a, a desire to separate functions out, like light retail, commercial, government, residential, religious. The zoning changes, specialized spaces throughout the evolution of Denver and other suburbia. So you can go to work, you could be separated from the industry, separated from your church, separated from your home and recreation. It was separated philosophy in urban design. There was a desire to create a highway through lower downtown Denver. There was a desire to have a higher education spaces, to remove what they call were slums or urban blight. We were a self-sustained community. We looked after our, each other. We didn't seek government assistance. So when, the, when the, the government grew into a urban renewal and new zoning and new planning uh, philosophies and values, we were, the community was somewhat um, in, left in a different time and space. The narrative has always somehow been over time that the government came in and gave you new housing and uh, we got these three college institutions and you got free education and everyone lived happily ever after. And that's why I'm here because of the, in, the false narrative. When they chose this, they didn't involve the community in the process of decision making or engagement or public notice. And uh, up until the vote, they were not aware of, of the consequences because this was promoted as higher education center with fun for funding. It wasn't promoted that 400 families and 200 businesses would be displaced, nor was it promoted that our heritage, our architectural heritage, would be demolished completely. The master plan of the campus called for the whole demolition of our landmarks, most of our churches, the Tivoli residential homes, warehouses, some of the beautiful architectural structures going back from the 1870s were scheduled for demolition. It destroyed our community because it took years of evolution and community bonding and sustainability and, and working together to create a, a very close community, shared community that couldn't be duplicated by, by splitting us up apart. Raising of funds, the presenting the concept and building and restoring this block of 14 homes was miraculous. What this is an example of are preservationist, community grassroots preservationist, who recognize not only the architectural significance, but because they were engaging with the community like coming to Casa Mayan, they were able to see the potential of saving something because they were engaged and visited our spaces, not just from maps, but actually walking the space. What was most exceptional was the timeline and the money and what was involved in preserving this three-acre, one-block area. The people involved in Historic Denver had to go through eight agencies and approvals to present this concept. They had to raise money they had like three months to come up with a plan. They had to raise probably the equivalent of one and a half million dollars in that short time. The fact that my family and other businesses fought against the confiscation, uh, we went to the state Supreme Court. At the same time, it allowed time for the historic Denver to raise the funds and present this plan. We have a beautiful preservation of architecture, but we don't have a, uh, an expression of social life, and certainly not Mexican-American life, of the built environment. That was the decisions made in 1972, 73, and 4. We're now 45 years, six years later. How can we bring back the Mexican-American expression and the indigenous expression of what this space was, how it was used and what it looked like? There are many examples in Denver and throughout the country
where minorities uh, through architecture, planning, and zoning have their culture suppressed and minimalized and trivialized. We know we have a model here to, to learn from architecturally, socially, to understand how we worked with our spaces and our community. That's why this is critical. That's why we can't be uh, thought of as, uh, as something of the past. There are lessons to be learned. There are tools you can get from understanding Casa Mayan. Casa Mayan was a microcosm of Auraria. If you under full understanding of what took place here, you understand Auraria, and you understand some of the issues that are going on to this day with indigenous communities or communities around the world. It's called the politics of space, where we have the space to gather, to protest, to celebrate. What do our, our, how do we engage with each other socially? How do we engage with our, our family? How do we engage with our neighborhoods, with our architecture, with our cities? What architectural features are contributing to the promotion or the suppression of people's rights and culture and the Mexican-American story? And this is why this park, why this house needs to be reprogrammed, reactivated to show that the Mexican people, that other indigenous peoples, our culture is alive and we need a space to not be told that we're dead and, and put up a monument or a slab of stone, that we need an interactive space that we had back when Casa Mine was at its peak, where we can come and share and have students and community, rich and poor, engage with us. So the question is, what histories are we going to preserve now? Can we respect the people who built the house in 1872? Can we respect the use of this house as a cultural center by Mexican Americans? How do we bring, what do we bring back and how do we express it? What do we do now in 2022 to preserve or tell the story of the slayered history? Question.